Hey everyone, Pastor Matt here. We have an incredible event coming up on Sunday, October 2nd, and we hope to see you there. It's called Storytellers. Imagine being able to come together with your faith community and hear about how God is working in other people's lives. We have one of our storytellers here now, Emily. Emily, are you excited for this event? I'm super excited. What's your story gonna be about? It's gonna be about my life and my relationship with God and how it's had lots of ups, ups and downs even since I was baptized and how the cross has really helped rooted it to what it is today. I can't wait to hear your story. We have two other storytellers. We have Craig and we also have Tracy and we have the legendary barista JW that's gonna be there. It's gonna be incredible. So please sign up online because reservations are required. Go to our website and join us at Storytellers. Yeah, I heard you did some really great coverage of that art show that they had here. Oh, Joey, you're too kind. And I gotta say, it's been great seeing you around here at church more often. Well, I'm only here because Jennifer invited me to church. Oh, hey, there she is now. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Joe. How are you guys? Got any more of that chocolate cake for me? Oh, no, no chocolate cake. But there are dinners on Wednesday night, so you can have food there. Right on. What else is going on? All right, well, another way to get connected at the church is the concert series. I love music. It's practically in my blood. Joy, what about you? I love music, too. Do you think there's something for each of us? Well, we have concerts for everybody all the way up through Christmas. In fact, go to the website and check it out. Another way you could get connected is you could join the choir. I would love to. You know, my Nana, she says I have a voice like an angel. And my Nana says I'll have a voice like a kangaroo. <laughs> I didn't want to turn my mic on. Good morning. Welcome to worship. How many of you have a voice of a kangaroo? <laughs> well, so good to see you. So great to start up such a beautiful morning with some beautiful singing. I know you kangaroos all stand up and join us. Come let us bow at His feet. 
things that is so true. You are so faithful, and we're just reminded of that through the words of this song that we've sung this morning, God. And sometimes I think it's so beautiful, God, whether it's through reading your word or, or maybe just taking times to declare through the words of a song the things that are about you, about your nature, and about your faithfulness. You're a loving Father, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your presence in this place. the words are on the screen, but as a declaration of the faithfulness of God, the things that he can do, the power that he has to do things that we can't. Our God is an overcomer, and he helps us to overcome through all things. That's why we sing this with faith. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. 
turn to the word we're gonna at this time share in our children's message and uh, as the uh, kids come forward pick up a piece of floor in front of me I know there's some of you out there come on down and uh, we share in that uh, special time together with our children we're all children of God come on up guys come on all right So I have something uh, special that I keep in my office that I want to show you today. Obviously, this is a hat. Do you know what kind of hat it is? Baseball. Yeah, it's a baseball hat. Um, do you know what team that is? Yeah, so here's the thing. Long before you were born, okay, the Diamondbacks won the World Series, all right? And uh, for some of us, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was in 2001, so none of you were born then but I was blessed to be at that game I'm a big baseball fan and love the Diamondbacks but guess what since they won that 21 years ago they haven't done so great some seasons better than others now how many here are ASU fans and were sad last night that Arizona State lost raise your hands all right all right how many of you are U of A fans and we're happy U of A won all right raise your hands all right all right so you know um, sometimes we win and sometimes we lose, but I keep this hat in my office because it's got World Series on it, and uh, 2001, there's a crown because they won the championship. But you know what? When you're a fan of a team, you're gonna win sometimes, and you're gonna lose sometimes, and that's kind of like life, right? Okay? I want everyone in this room who's ever had a bad day, raise your hand, all right? If you haven't raised your hand, you're not being honest in church, okay? So. <laughs> But, but the reality is, is that we win some and we lose some. And the good news is this, and we're gonna hear about this in the message today. I love that song that the band just sang about seeing a victory, because we're gonna talk about the fact that the greatest gift of all is Jesus is with us. Good days and bad days, and when we win and when we lose. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful, whether we win or lose, whether we have good days or bad days, you're always with us. That's a great gift that you give us. Jesus is always beside us. When we're walking through the valleys and when we're on top of the mountain, you're with us. Thank you for that. Thank you for your grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming up. And as they head back to their seats, let's move out of our seats as we're able and share God's peace with one another. you're settling in, we just invite you to remain seated for a moment. We're going to continue in our worship, obviously. Um, one of the things we do every week that you guys uh, that are here are familiar with is just present our offerings to the Lord, and we're going to do that at this time. But I invite you, um, as you desire, as you will, um, if you feel so um, 
you can stand up again and let's just worship him. Let's just keep our hearts focused, having words. Our wonderful and beautiful Savior. You unravel me with a melody and you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer that and just lift your voices up in that chorus one more time and just sing this I'm no longer slave to fear I am the child of God oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am Now we will turn to the Word. Brenda, would you come up and read this morning's passage for us? Good morning. It's found on page 682 in the Pew Bibles, the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, and so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left and the angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Temptation. When we think of that word, I think most of us think of temptation in the form of overindulging with too much dessert, or maybe eating too many chocolates, or maybe spending too much money at a store or on a vacation. But when we go to the word and we look at scripture, temptation is a very, very serious thing. And you know, there have been studies done that over the past 30 or 40 years in America that the name of Satan has been mentioned less and less and less in Christian churches. And I think part of that is that we kind of tend to dismiss Satan as someone with pointy horns and a pitchfork. We tend to dismiss him as someone who is not real, But the power of the evil one was very real in the desert there for Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, and the power of the evil one is very real in this desert today where you and I live. So we're going to explore what temptation is this morning, and we're going to go through these three temptations of our Lord and see how they hold a mirror up to the way we experience temptation in your life and mine. Maybe very different for each of us in different ways, but they all have a common thread and a common theme. And I I want to start off with something that you may not realize this morning. It comes from that famous Christian author, C.S. Lewis. He says, temptation and the ways in which Satan attacks you and me don't always come at the points of our life that we consider to be the weak part, but often he attacks us at the point of our dominating nature and interests. What does that mean? What does that mean for you and me? Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a type A personality. You're a person who likes to be in charge, likes to have things organized. Then that may mean that Satan for you will want you to seek even more control and power over your life rather than submitting your life to Jesus Christ that you believe you can control everything. Or maybe you're a person who actually is maybe a little insecure about yourself. I mean, let's face it, we're all insecure on some level about ourselves, but maybe you doubt yourself a lot. Maybe you don't see yourself as a child of God. Maybe you don't believe that you have gifts that you can offer God. And then Satan will assail you by trying to place even more doubt in your life by telling you you're not a good person or that you don't have those gifts. Satan does not always attack us at the weak parts of our life, but at the points of our dominating nature, the way we most are. And so let's look at the first temptation of Jesus Christ in that desert and see how it applies to you and me in this desert. If you are the son of God, Satan says, command these stones to become bread. Now, we have to know the background, right? Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. He is very hungry. He's probably very weak in his human form. And so Satan comes along to tempt him. And when we look at this temptation, you and I kind of just tend to leave it at this level. Well, Jesus was hungry, so Satan's trying to tempt him by turning these stones into bread. But there's something far greater going on with this temptation that we also have to hold up in our lives to understand. You see, everyone loves to eat. Everyone loves to eat. But how many of us on a daily basis want to hear God's will and do God's will in our life? That's really what this temptation is about. It's about hearing God's will in our life and doing his will. Everyone wants to eat. Everyone wants to follow their own self-interest. But how many of us have asked the question in our lives, is this God's will? Is this God's will for my family? 
Is this God's will in my workplace? Is this God's will for me in my daily life? When was the last time you asked that question in your life and really took time to pray about that? When was the last time we asked that as a church? Is our life here as a church simply about doing many busy things and many programs or activities, or do we stop to ask, is this God's will? You see, this is the first temptation, and a very real one. And it has very little to do with what goes in our bellies or overindulging in a dessert or chocolate, but with the temptation to not do God's will and simply feed our own desires. That's the shape of that temptation. And then there's a second shape of temptation that comes in that second temptation that we heard read for us this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. Satan takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, one of the tallest of all places. And there he says, Jesus, hurl yourself down from this temple. After all, you're God's son. You're God's son. The angels are going to take care of you. You know, you can jump off this thing. No harm is going to befall you. You're God's son. And here, Satan believes he has an ace in the hole. Because what this is really about is it has very little to do with you or I going up to the tallest part of the La Casa de Cristo campus, to our sanctuary or our bell tower, and jumping and believing God will save us. But it has everything to do with how we view how God takes care of us in our everyday life. Let me say this again. You see, what this temptation is, is that God will grant us an exemption. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. I'm a pastor. Nothing bad should ever happen to me. I'm a Christian. I'm a good person. God, why do bad things happen to me? Why does tragedy happen in life? Why is there pain and suffering? Why do I have problems at work or financial issues or medical or health issues? Or why am I not dealing with uh, aging gracefully in the midst of life? Why do these things happen? And somehow in the back of our minds, we all believe as Christians that we should be exempted from these things because we believe in God and he should just surround us in a bubble and everything's going to be great but that's not the way life works. And if you think it is, look at Jesus himself. Mocked, scourged, gossiped about, spat upon, tortured, ultimately put to death on a cross. Is that an exemption? God protecting him? Now, here's the reality. God does watch out for us. God does care for us, but not in the ways we think. We think because most of our prayers consist of God do this for me, God do that, God make this good for me in my life, make this happen for me. I mean, let's be honest, that's what most of our prayers are. But what we fail to see is Jesus Christ walks with you and me every day through the valleys, through the mountaintops, through the winning, through the losing. And that's the gift that he gives us. You know, that storm on the Sea of Galilee The disciples and Jesus weren't exempted from that storm, but Jesus was with them in the midst of the storm. And that's what we need to see. And in this temptation, you know, Jesus is very clear. He says, don't put God to the test. Don't say to God, God, if you're really God, just be good to me. He's already been good to us. He gives us his grace every day. There's a man that you've probably never heard of who died recently. His name was Franz Mohr. And Franz played the piano at some of the world's great venues, Carnegie Hall. He played a piano at the White House for presidents and foreign dignitaries. He was at concert venues all over this country and internationally before people would perform. World famous celebrities, classical music, rock music, it didn't matter. Franz was always there. Because you see, Franz was a piano tuner for Steinway and Sons Piano. Steinways are world famous pianos. And it was Franz's job to always go in and make sure those pianos were tuned at the White House, at Carnegie Hall, or at a famous concert or venue. And sometimes if it 
had a problem during the concert, he would be called upon to help. And sometimes he was praised and sometimes he was yelled at. But Henry Steinway of Steinway Piano said of Franz this, he said, Franz was a Christian. And he just saw himself as a servant. And he never sought the limelight. And he actually referred to himself as a Christian plotter, someone who just plotted along in life, faithful in the little things, faithful in the little things, so that he could be faithful in the larger things. Now, if I called you a plotter in life, you probably wouldn't like it. And if I was called a plotter, I wouldn't like that either because we all think of that as someone who just kind of, eh, you know, whatever, and just kind of goes through life. But what Franz shows us is that's what faith's all about. Through the good and the bad, the ins and the outs, we're not always going to live life at a high level, a, a level of constant success, a level of constantly things always going well for us. But it's that faithfulness in the little things every day with our spouses, with our families, in our relationships, in the pain that we have in life, the pain from death, the pain from divorce, whatever that may be for you, for me, it's that faithfulness in the little things. And then that last temptation in the desert for Jesus that is also applicable to our desert. He takes them before all the kingdoms of the world, all the earthly power. You'll see it in the news tomorrow, all the earthly power of the world, presidents and monarchs gathered in England for the death of the queen. You'll see all that worldly temporal power on display. And Satan says, Jesus, if you will just bend your knee to me, you'll receive all this praise, all this adulation, all these compliments. Now, Jesus already had the keys to the kingdom. Jesus is already God's son. He knew that. He knew who he was. What's the temptation here? Satan wanted Jesus to redefine success for himself on his own terms. And the question for you and me is, what is your definition of success in life? I think that's a question we all need to ask. What's your definition of success? Is it to always be the star athlete or star student? Is your definition of success to gain money, fame, power, titles, wealth? material things? Or is success defined differently for a follower of Jesus Christ? It's a great question for us to ask as a church too. How do we define success as a church? Is it program, numbers, budgets? Or is it about serving those that are lost, lost spiritually, hungry, homeless, struggling. So you see, the shape of temptation for you and for me is very different. And it's not something that can be dismissed, but there is one thing more in this lesson that was read for us in the gospel this morning. The gospel ends this way, and Satan left him, and angels came and ministered to him. But you know what's interesting about this? This temptation story is also present in the Gospel of Luke. And when you read the Gospel of Luke's account, it ends in a very different way. This is how Luke ends the temptation, and we really need to listen to this this morning. Because this is what happened to Jesus, and this is what will happen to you and me. This is how Luke ends it. The devil left him waiting for another opportune time to attack him. Satan wasn't done with Jesus when that temptation in the wilderness was over. He was like a little dog yapping at his heels his entire three years on earth. And Satan would use other people to try to get Jesus to do his bidding. Jesus, if you're God's son, just announce it. Just declare yourself king. Jesus, if you're really the Messiah, just do this. Perform this miracle. Heal in this way. Do it this way. Do it that way. And that's what Satan's trying to do here. He's trying to get him to define these things on his own terms. And Jesus isn't buying it. Jesus isn't buying it. 
don't test God. Don't test God. Don't look at all these kingdoms in terms of earthly power. And in the midst of all of this, what we see and understand is Satan is always going to be present in our life. Now, here's the great good news. Every time you walk into this gathering place, I hope you'll do what some of our members and I do, which is you look up here at this cross and you realize what the empty cross means. We sang it earlier in the service and see a victory. We sang it earlier. The war's over. The battle's won. Satan's been destroyed. He yapped at Jesus' heels all the way to a cross and all the way to an empty tomb, but ultimately he was destroyed on Easter morning. Now, he's still going to try to drag us down. He's still going to try to tempt us. But the great good news is all we have to do is say these two little words when we're threatened and tempted. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Back away, Satan. I believe in Jesus Christ. The cross is empty. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. You're going to have to figure out for yourself what and how the shape of temptation is. But the war's over. The battle's been won. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to worship at this time by moving into our time of communion, and I am going to have the band come up at this time and uh, lead us in the musical portion of our time of communion. But we also need to understand that this is a victory that Jesus won for us as well. So, you know, when Jesus went back into heaven, he had given instructions to his disciples And one of these instructions comes to us through the form of this meal. This just isn't bread. This just isn't wine. This just isn't a tradition that we do every couple of Sundays. This isn't just something we go through the motions with. This is his body. This is his blood. And so we recall that on that night, he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them. And he said, take and eat because this is my body. And then again, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is now the new covenant because it's shed in my blood. Every time you drink this, do this to remember me. Because as long as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim his death until he returns again. This is the victory he gives us. So despite our brokenness, despite our temptations, despite our failures and our flaws, he comes to you and me to give us that gift. And in a few minutes, our worship will end, but our service is just beginning to go out into the world and share that good news. Please pray with me the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in him, lo it be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I'll invite the community assistants to come forward while they're coming forward. If you're visiting with us today or with us for one of the first times, you're welcome to the Lord's table. This is a free gift that he gives to all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. If small children are present, they've received communion instructions, they can extend their hands, and if not, they can keep their hands at their side and share in a blessing. God's gifts are ready for his people. Our ushers will guide you forward and into the appropriate line to receive the Lord's Supper.
Good morning, Father. We are grateful, grateful for the gift of this meal. We know that this is far more than bread and wine. It is your body and your blood. So use it to strengthen us for the week ahead and help us to always be reminded that the tempter is there, wanting us to define success on our own terms, not asking the question, is this your will? and wanting to substitute what we can eat for doing your will. God, guide us. We are broken and flawed people, but we are saved by your grace. And thank you for the gift of Good Friday and Easter, the gift of the empty cross, and help us to claim that promise in our lives daily. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and smile upon us and grant us his favor and his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
God bless you. Have a wonderful week.